Hello, my name is Eben Goodstein, and I'm an economics professor at Lewis and Clark College. Welcome to the Oregon Climate Dialogue. On February 5th and 6th, over 50 Oregon colleges, universities, high schools, and other institutions will be engaging in a discussion about what we can do now to change the future. We're very honored to have Governor Ted Kulingowski here to introduce this discussion. Hello, I'm Oregon Governor Ted Kulingowski. I want to welcome you to this national teach-in on global warming solutions. There is no issue that's more important to this state, to this country, and to the world than this discussion and this dialogue that you're engaging in today. The issue of climate change is not just an issue that involves the economy or the environment. It is how do we build a green economy that provides the living wage jobs that we're looking for and at the same time preserve our quality of life. Your participation today can make a difference. You can actually sit down and uh, write letters. You can come to Salem. You need to participate in the dialogue inside the state capitol building. One of the things that uh, I, as governor of this state that I've become to realize more and more that uh, there is a, a revolution going on in this country right now around this issue about climate change. I want to thank each and every one of you for participating. Believe, as I do, that this is something we can do as a people. It is critically important that in this tough economic time, we don't hide, but we actually pick our heads up and move forward into the future because what we do around the issue of climate change will determine the future, both of our economy and our quality of life. Thank you all very, very much for participating. The backdrop for these discussions is the science provided by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. The IPCC is the body that's charged with synthesizing global warming science. And according to the IPCC, over the next century, the Earth is going to heat up somewhere between 3 and 10 degrees Fahrenheit. To put those numbers in perspective, 10 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a swing in global temperatures of ice age magnitude, only in the opposite direction. The IPCC has also shown that if the United States fails to act aggressively over the next couple of years to cut global warming pollution and to begin to invest in clean energy technologies, then that low end, three to four degree Fahrenheit warming window is going to close for our kids forever. With the election of President Obama, a lot of attention has been turned to Washington, D.C., people looking for solutions both to the climate crisis and to the economic challenges that we're facing. But what's happening right here in Oregon over the next few months will also be important, and not just for the future of Oregon, but for the future of the planet. Oregon is poised to put in place some of the most aggressive global warming policies in the country. And uh, what happens in Oregon uh, as a leader uh, may very well raise the bar for federal action. Oregon has also made clean energy and renewable technology the cornerstone of its economic development strategy. Can we stabilize the climate and also promote sustainable economic development at the same time. To explore these possibilities, we invited two Oregon experts. Angus Duncan is a longtime leader in renewable energy and clean energy technologies and is chair of the Oregon Global Warming Commission. Dave Van Toff is sustainability policy advisor to Governor Kulingowski. So Oregon does, it has one of the most aggressive goals. It's a, you know, uh, within the Western Climate Initiative, you know, we're aiming at reaching 10% below 1990 levels by 2020. On balance, we will economically advantage Oregon if we move along this transition path to a low e carbon economy faster than any other state in the country. And we will be advantaged because we will both have changed our carbon practices sooner, um, so we won't have to make drastic cuts later as other states will. Um, and because we will have developed the goods and services and practices and tools that allowed us to do that and we'll turn around and sell them. This is definitely going to be hard work, but on a, on a clear, predictable path to meeting that 2050 goal uh, for a lot of reasons. One is to accomplish the reductions. A second one, frankly, is to give people some investment predictability. If they know where carbon reductions are headed, on an interim basis, if they know what that path is, they can start adjusting their investment choices to that path. Oregon is being called the solar manufacturing capital of North America. We've had seven 
uh, international solar uh, manufacturers decide to locate in Oregon and it's creating a, uh, a nexus for solar manufacturing here in this state and, and thousands of jobs when, fully, when they're fully phased in. Yeah, we're also fortunate to have two of the largest wind uh, uh, energy companies in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the nation uh, located headquartered in, in, in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, both Ibadrola and Vestas. Vestas has talked about uh, and is in the process of expanding its uh, uh, corporate headquarters here in Portland, Oregon, and, and that's another uh, uh, really positive thing. This is a, a huge opportunity in, in, uh, in growth uh, opportunity for rural Oregon, and that's really part of the governor's uh, focus has been how do we create job growth and economic growth uh, outside of just the, uh, the metropolitan areas, which has been a challenge with the uh, declining timber industry and, and other sectors there. And this has been a great opportunity and, and, and proven to, to um, generate uh, lots of new income uh, in eastern Oregon. Each of the wind turbines that go up create uh, leasing opportunities for the farmers uh, that are significant. Many farmers are saying that, the, the, that this is uh, a, a core part of their, um, their diversity of their, uh, of their budget and their, 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 their um, business case uh, now in terms of, of being sustainable. Uh, new new uh, tax uh, um, benefits for the local economies, for the, for the counties, Morrill County and other counties in Eastern Oregon. It's a significant part of the tax base now. Biodiesel has been a real jobs creator. The, the two, uh, we've had two large biodiesel facilities uh, um, open up since the 2007 uh, tax credit expansions, one in Klatskanai and one in Boardman, both in rural parts of Oregon, creating uh, hundreds of jobs uh, and uh, sustainable jobs in those, in those uh, re regions. In the late 1970s and into the 80s, um, where we made a decision and eventually we embedded it in federal statute that said if we need new energy um, we will first get it from investing in energy efficiency until we've got all the cost-effective energy efficiency we can get then we'll go out and look for cost-effective renewables and the last in that priority um, is uh, is fossil fuels. I actually had uh, the power council staff go back and, and uh, uh, take a look at how much money we had put into energy efficiency as a region over 20 years or so, and it came out to about $2.4 billion. I mean, that's a lot of money. Uh, but then I asked them the, the follow-up question, which is, uh, and, and uh, what's the return on that investment? They basically said that we recover that $2.4 billion once every 26 months. Do the math, that's about a 40 to 50 percent average annual rate of return. Oregon has, has a long tradition, as you know, in, in terms of uh, both being uh, ahead of the game on environmental issues, the bottle bill, land use, and what have you. And uh, in the, the past decade, Oregon has stepped up uh, to the climate change issue and has really uh, identified as a core uh, policy issue that they want to advance, both at the uh, local levels, the city of Portland has, has done wonderful things. Uh, and the Governor Kulongowski, when he came in uh, to office six years ago, identified it as a top priority. And that was important in the context that at the federal level, there, there really was no uh, aggressive policy being developed around climate change. And so it, was, it devolved to states to try and play that leadership role, and Oregon stepped into that. Uh, and that into that position along with some other progressive states. Okay. Accomplished a lot. The, uh, the governors uh, established uh, several um, policies that are, have real reduction uh, values uh, around them. Uh, the renewable portfolio standard uh, for renewable energy uh, requires 25% of uh, new renewable energy uh, sources in our utility mix so that you and I are, are using 25% of new sources of renewable energy by 2025. 20, uh, That's a, a major step forward in terms of getting renewable energy uh, to become the basis for our energy economy and to reduce our reliance on coal and other fossil fuel sources. Uh, biofuel standards, similarly in the transportation fuel uh, sector, we've uh, required blending of uh, ethanol and, and biodiesel into our fuel system to reduce the fossil fuel mix uh, in, in the transportation fuel and reduce our reliance on uh, foreign sources of oil at the same time. Um, the uh, uh, California tailpipe emission standards that Oregon adopted uh, will have probably the most uh, significant impact in terms of real greenhouse gas reductions. We are on track to arrest our uh, growth of emissions by 2010, so that's, that's the good news. But the, the challenge is going to be how are we going to reduce our emissions uh, to the 10% below 1990 levels by 2020, and that's uh, the basis for our next steps. But Oregon's going to move forward. The governor has an agenda for the upcoming 2009 session to, uh, to create the reductions that are uh, now required under statute. And uh, kind of the kind of the centerpiece of that is, is a cap and trade pr uh, proposal, of complementary measures uh, to achieve reductions, and that includes uh, significant increases in energy efficiency, uh, uh, continued increase in renewable energy development, 
and also uh, integrating climate change principles into our transportation structure and figuring out how to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in that sector. A cap and trade sets up a cap for the uh, large emitters of, of greenhouse gas emissions and then over time requires them to reduce their emissions uh, to the levels that are, are uh, st stipulated under the cap and trade legislation. Uh, so it, it provides that certainty. Uh, the, the trade part of it is a market-based system to try and make sure that you're achieving those reductions at the least cost possible uh, from an economic perspective. And it creates flexibility for uh, the large-scale emitters to uh, have, have different tools in their toolbox to achieve the reductions. They can achieve the reductions at their facility, for instance, or they can go into the market and purchase allowances that uh, account for the reductions that they have to achieve uh, over time. Why is it important for Oregon to be a leader? Why don't, why don't we just wait for the rest of the country to move ahead? Leaders invite followers, especially if their leadership is successful, and ours historically has been. Um, and the other thing that happens is, frankly, is leaders um, do better economically than followers do. You know, we develop the technologies, we develop the techniques, we develop the practices. Yeah, we we develop the um, the the contracting tools that become a standard for the rest of the country and sometimes the rest of the world. Folks come from all over the world to look at the kind of transportation energy choices and land use energy choices we make in Oregon and particularly in Portland. Um, and we turn around actually and are then able to sell consulting services and, and practices to folks elsewhere in the country. We're branding Oregon as the place people come for solutions. We're branding it as the place people come for products. We also frankly, you know, I think want to be more aggressive here in the West within the Western Climate Initiative than a lot of other states are going to be. Uh, that's in part because we don't rely as much on coal as other states do. About 75% of the pulverized coal that's burned in the United States is burned east of the Mississippi River. And if you're a U.S. Senator from a state that relies that heavily on coal, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or for that matter an, uh, an avid environmentalist, you're going to have to look out for the interests of your people. So there's going to be a real balancing act in which it's going to be important for states like Oregon and California and Washington and the other Western Climate Initiative states to assert both their, their, their parochial interests and then their much broader interest in more aggressive goals and more aggressive reductions, which the science really is telling us, you know, we have to start ramping up on, you know, sooner rather than later. We think Oregon ought to be moving ahead with adopting a cap and trade policy uh, for a lot of reasons. The most important one is that we think whatever design choices we make will then have an influence on the national choices. We think that this is the best economic opportunity for the state of Oregon. It's a competitive advantage that we that we have. People look to Oregon as kind of being the innovators in terms of green, uh, green ideas, green technology. For many of the analysts in terms of uh, uh, where, where the markets are heading, look at the energy sector and the clean tech sector as being one of the biggest uh, growth areas in the world in terms of the next 20-30 years of investment. So Oregon is very well positioned and we're increasing our uh, position around that whole economic piece. Uh, but it's also about uh, what is the right thing to do and Oregon, uh, Oregonians have always wanted to be uh, doing the right thing from an environmental perspective and as the, as the science around climate change has become increasingly clear and increasingly dire, uh, Oregon is, has led and is going to continue to lead so that we're reducing our, our footprint in a way that's saving us money, uh, that's good for the environment, uh, and is creating sustainable jobs in Oregon. This year, Oregon is celebrating its 150th anniversary of statehood, and audiences around the state are, this week, looking 50 years into the future. Can we afford an aggressive policy to reduce global warming pollution and rewire the entire state with a new generation of clean energy technologies? Can we afford not to? And if not, how then will our children live in this world? The Oregon Climate Dialogue is promoting open and wide-ranging debate on these important issues. Thanks for your participation.